MC, Dr. Dinesh Gautam. So, without any further ado, I would like to uh, request uh, today's first uh, key keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Roshan Adhikari. Uh, um, without first uh, talking about Dr. Adhikari, he was born and raised on a living and family farm in Nepal. He received his veterinary degree from Trivon University, Nepal in 2008, and his master's degree in London, United Kingdom. After his master's, he worked at the University of Man Manitoba, Canada Department of Animal Science for two years, looking at laying hands, broiler nutrition, proximate analysis of feed stuff, and managing nutrigenomics and cell culture lab with Dr. Wu Kim. He completed his PhD in poultry nutrition at the University of Georgia, Department of Poultry Science in 2017. Currently, he is product development manager with CJ Bio for North America. In his current role, he is focused on understanding the functional properties of amino acid on performance, health, and welfare in broiler, uh, broilers, breeders, turkeys, and laying hens. He has been collaborating with industry and uni university research partners in the United States of America to understand the uses of various limiting feed grade amino acids in poultry. Before CJ Bio, he was a technical service manager at Kerry for North America, where he supported the North American poultry and swine customers regarding enzyme and gut health. Russell has published over 20 peer-reviewed scientific papers and presented over 50 abstracts at scientific meetings and conferences. He is a reviewer of the Journal of Applied Poultry Research, Poultry Science, and other different scientific journals. He is vice president of Southern Poultry Science Society that organizes the International Poultry Scientific Forum at IPPE every January. Dr. Rusan's education and expertise around poultry industry in past 15 years in four different countries empowered him to learn poultry nutrition, disease, and management in different conditions and part of the world. So uh, now the floor is yours. Dr. Rusan, please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, all the participants, no matter which part of the world you are in. Uh, as I'm sharing the screen, I would like to thank everybody who has participated here in this program today. I know your time is important. You could have been doing other things and you gave your time today for me, and I very much appreciate that. What we will try to do in this one and a half hour is We'll try to make it as a discussion session rather than a monologue. So, so I'll, I'll try to tell some stories. I'll try to tell some of the learnings that we have been doing with a couple of um, farms here and some of the products and nutritionists that we work together with. So we'll, I'll try to share with some of the data that our team has worked together with the university and the, and the farmers here. And I would like to get your feedback and thoughts on what you guys are seeing and how that has been in that part of the world. So without uh, further ado, let's start with the case study. As a veterinarian and nutritionist, you, I guess you guys are bored of case study, but let me tell you a story here. So this was um, one of the farm uh, or one of the integrator here who manages about um, 3 million birds every week. So they, they kill about 3 million birds every week. And, and we were running some programs with them. We implemented a local protein diet on theirs uh, because most of the uh, farmers here in the United States, they do not formulate on local protein. They, they don't have a minimum protein ratio. What we do is we formulate on most of the lysine to other amino acid ideal protein ratios, which I'll explain to you in a later slide. And most of you have already known what it is. Uh, this was a program where they wanted to go from having a cool protein restriction to not having a cool protein restriction and, and having a lower cool protein diet. So here, here you can see program A and program B. Program A is their original program where they were still running half of their birds in a different complex. In program B, what they did was they implemented the valine program. So they reduced the cool protein from there and they added the valine. So if you look at the diets here, the lysine in a starter or a grower or finisher or withdrawal, it's exactly the same in both the programs. 
okay? And methionine or DSAA, both of them are exactly the same in both of the programs too. So that happens to be our first and second limiting amino acid in the diet. The arginine, which I haven't written here, is the same for both program A and B as well. What comes in a difference is the fourth limiting amino acid, which is valine in their case, and they increase the amount of valine here. You can see in starter, you have about five point more, grower 68 versus 78, about 10 points more, finisher and withdrawal 66 versus 78. So they went on program B and program A for about six months. We came back on a meeting with them and what they said was program B, where they took the crude protein out of their diet or minimum crude protein out of their diet, and they implemented a higher fourth limiting amino acid, which is valine, is having a bad performance by about two to six points, depending on which week they process the products. So the question from the nutritionist on their program or on that farm or on that complex was, I'm going to remove this valine from here. I'm going to go back to program A. I'm going to increase my crude protein to the diet. Do you guys have any suggestions? What is your thought? So we, we sat down on that table with this discussion. And my question to the audience is, what would be your thought process to the nutritionist? Because you don't want them to increase their crude protein because that is going to have a negative effect in their diet. And you all know what is the negative effect of crude protein on gut health and the performance of the birds. But at the same time, you don't want your customer or your producer to increase the valine, which is costing them money, but they are, they are losing about two to six point of fit conversion ratio on those birds. So they are losing money on both ends. They're paying higher for the diet cost, but they're losing money on the performance of the birds because they are not getting as big of a burden program B as much as program A. So what could be the solution for it? The answer to this, we are going to discuss this at last, but as I discussed through the slides, hopefully this question becomes more and more clearer. So I would like y'all to pay a little bit more attention and see if there are any clues that we can come back to this slide later on at the end of the presentation and try to discuss what we can do. If you're having thoughts during the presentation, you are more than welcome to write it in the chat box and see what your thought process is or what would you do as a technical service manager or a technical advisor to those nutritionists or to those uh, complexes when you are dealing with those kind of situations. So let's look at what we're going to do today, right? Uh, the, the main objective today is to look at four different things. The first one I'm going to discuss is the fourth, fifth, and sixth limiting amino acid in the diet. Why not first, second, and third? Because first, second, and third has been widely used in our poultry industry for a long time. We started using lysine and methionine in 1950s, 1970s. We started using threonine in about 2000, 2010. And, and every, almost in every diet, we have lysine, methionine, and threonine. But we do not look at fourth, fifth, and sixth limiting amino acid as much as we look at the first, second, and third. So the objective of mine is to start thinking or, or give some thoughts to y'all on looking at the fourth, fifth, and sixth, what, would it, what it could be, how it could impact, and, and, and how, how do we deal with those in the diets as we reduce the crude protein in our diet. The, the topics that, that we will touch in those fourth, fifth, and sixth limiting amino acid would be the branch and amino acid, which could be fourth or fifth in your diet, depending on the feed ingredient, the arginine, which could be fourth, fifth, or sixth, and the another is tryptophan. So I'm going to touch these three. If we discuss each of these topics, each of these four topics can be discussed for half a day. So I'm trying to cramp all four of them in about 70, 75 minutes talk. So this is going to be messy. This is going to be a lot of data. But like our chief guest yesterday said, this is just a platform to open a communication between you guys and us. So if you all have any questions in the future or during this presentation or any time, you are more than welcome to reach out to me and, and discuss any of those topics as we go through. So this is actually opening up. A, this is a trailer of a movie to open up a whole movie in the future. Let me see if I can move forward on those. 
So how does using a lower, you know, a lower limiting amino acid reduces the crude protein, right? Because in the first slide, I told you about crude protein. Then we also talked about fourth, second, third, fourth, and fifth limiting amino acid to the diet. But what are those? This is a liver barrel, and this barrel is widely used. So every undergraduate that goes through either nutrition class or chemistry class reads this. What this tells is no matter how much crude protein you feed into the diet, right? Yesterday, we had an excellent talk from two speakers about the protein and the energy. And most of the time we look at crude protein. Crude protein is a good benchmark for us because we want to understand how much of that protein it has. But as we evolve through this process, we also need to understand crude protein, just having higher crude protein is not the best. For us, the best is if they have a balanced amino acid in that diet or in that ingredient and is that amino is that protein that is present readily digestible for the animal so we are going to talk about balance right if you look at here this ingredient or this diet has methane in the lowest so no matter how much other amino acid you put into the diet this animal is not going to perform more because methane is limiting here so it's almost like if you fill the water here it is never going to fill above this platform of methane because that water is going to spill away. So that is the same case with amino acid as well. And that is your first limiting amino acid. So how do you define your limiting amino acid? The amino acid that will reduce the capacity of that bird to perform further. In this case, what is that? It is methane. What you can do is if you if you look at those birds or those diets, what the board will do is below this graph here, this is going to be used for protein accretion and growth performance and all of the maintenance activities. This orange bar that I'm showing up here, this is, an, this is a waste. The body is going to use energy, throw it away. It's going to go to the hindgut and used by the putrefaction bacteria and it's going to have a negative effect. It's going to go to the liter and increase your ammonia have to have a negative impact on food pad and all of that negative effects. What you could do is you could bring that bar up here. You see this green bar? I could raise this bar from here to here. What do I have to do to that? If I add methane, my bar will go up all the way from here to here. And now I can utilize this much extra of the protein that is already available in that animal or feeding ingredient for maintenance or performance of that bird. So if you look at the first figure on your left, you could only use the lower part of this. If you look at the figure on the right, you could reach up to this green point. So you just raise the bar of that performance of that animal on the feed by adding some methane. If we look in a practical diet, what does that mean? This is a turkey diet for 10 to 12 weeks of turkey. And I, I chose turkey, even though knowing that you all use more broiler and layers than turkeys, because it is easier to show me on the crude protein side. The, the idea is the same. What I'm doing here is I'm just showing you guys only few ingredients that is exactly needed, the macro ingredients and the, and the amino acid as well. So don't look at this and say, hey, this, this guy doesn't have any minerals or calcium or phosphorus. I'm not putting this here because it makes the data or it makes the presentation messy. So I'm trying to raise a point here. What I'm trying to do is if you add methane, your crude protein, look at the crude protein, it's 28.85. Your lysine is limited at 1.42, okay? I bring my lysine to the diet or methane and lysine into that, what, that, what that does is it reduces my cost. It reduces my crude protein from 28.85 to 27.4. My lysine is still the same. And my other amino acid ratio is still above what my minimum requirement is. As I bring lysine, methane, and threonine, which is most of the diet that we use in the world right now, in the, in the poultry side, in the swine side, they are way ahead of us. So let's not talk about swine. That's a whole different story. They are way, way ahead of us in the, on the ammunition nutrition, especially in the US. So when you use this lysine, methane, and threonine, you bring the third amino acid in the crystalline form and you reduce your crude protein further by 1.5%. Your lysine is still the same. Your all the minimum amino acid requirement is met. So if you compare from your first diet to your third diet where we are currently in most of our most of our feed 
Uh, in the US, we are in the fourth, but I'm putting three in because if you look at the research papers or most of the other part of the world, lysinitine and three is the common uh, synthetic amino acid that is used. I have already gone from 28.8 to 25.9. So I bring in fourth, which is valine in this case. I go back down about 1% of my crude protein. I'm still meeting all the synthetic amino acids and my lysine is still the same. So you compute your first versus your fourth. That is, ex that is exactly the picture that I'm trying to show. The first one and the fourth one, your crude protein is 28.85, but it's still giving the same amount of performance for the birds or maybe lower because of the negative effects than what the fourth would give because the fourth is raising the bar for the animals to meet the performance benefits by reducing at least 4% of that crude protein. What does that 4% crude protein does to the, to the feed formulation on your paper, on the cost and the health of the bird? Let's look at it in that two other slides here. If we can reduce that crude protein into the diet, but still maintain the required amino acid by balancing those, that can help to improve the performance, that can help to reduce the amount of nitrogen that is going to the hindgut. And once it goes to the hindgut, that is a food for the negative bacteria, your prostrodium perfringes, your negative bacteria, putrefication bacteria that brings the volatile fatty acids, the negative fatty acids that all will create a negative balance uh, for those birds. As it goes, towards those, it creates more weight litter, more feed, food pad lesions, more litter nitrogen, and also feed cost. So it is all negative if you have more crude protein in the diet. So trying to reduce the crude protein by balancing the amino acid is the way to go for better health and for the cost of money as well. Most of the research that has published, what it says is if you can reduce about 1% crude protein in your diet, you can reduce about 3% water intake, and you can reduce about 10% of liter nitrogen. So imagine a previous formulation that we saw, we reduced about 4% crude protein from using only methionine to using methionine, lysine, threonine, and valine, and balancing the lower limiting amino acids. In that case, we could be benefiting by reducing the water intake, which could help to reduce the weight litter, we, we could be benefiting by reducing the amount of liter nitrogen, and we could be benefiting by gut health as well. This is one of the research that we did at University of Georgia with uh, one of the poultry producer. And, and you can see the first bar graph on the red is a positive control where they used only lysine, methane, and threonine. The yellow bar is where they added valine. The blue bar is where they added valine and arsenine. The pink bar is valine, arsenine, isolicine. And in the green bar, we used valine arsenine, acylicine, and glycine serine to balance back to the first one. And you can see as we reduced the crude protein and added the synthetic amino acid to balance the lower limiting amino acid, it did not reduce performance, but it reduced the amount of food pad score. So it was there were more healthier food pad for the, for the birds. It reduced the liter nitrogen, and it also reduced the liter moisture. So all in all, this is a management benefit for the birds. And I'm not sure if you all look at food paddy score there in, uh, in Nepal and India and how much that plays into a role. But here in US, it is big because we export most of the chicken paws to other countries and they make as much money as the breast of a chicken will make in some of the times. So food pad is a big issue here in US and we, we take care of the food so that we can get extra money for the farmers. And what I was talking about earlier also shows in this graph. Here, what I'm trying to show is a broiler starter diet, which uses methionine, lysine, and threonine in a synthetic form. And what it does is it is balancing the methionine, lysine, and threonine at 100% requirement. It is bringing its fourth limiting amino acid, which is valine in this case, near to 100. But its fifth, sixth, and seventh other limiting amino acid is excess to 100. So all of these above the blue bar is at waste. If you bring a fourth limiting amino acid, what it does is what you see in a blue bar here. It reduces the extra cost of the feed. It also reduces the extra waste of those nutrients, which is helpful both on the cost and on the bird health as well. In a commercial aspect, what do we see? 
And here again, I'm trying to show uh, methanyl lysine threonine, which is a common diet with crude protein restriction, the crude protein 19.5. I took out the crude protein restriction. It went back about 0.4%. It is still balancing all the amino acids. I included fourth. The crude protein went down by 0.25% again. I'm still balancing all the limiting amino acids. And what that does by balancing that much is a reduction in feed cost. So I reduced about between crude protein restriction and no crude protein restriction, but balancing all the amino acids, there was about $3 saving. By including fourth limiting amino acid, and all this dictates on the amount of or the cost of your corn, soy, fat, and other amino acids too. But in this case, where I kept the cost per ton feed, by using the fourth limiting amino acid, we were about saving about 1.8 or a dollar and 89 cent. If we put this in a perspective for a meal, our average meal in US makes about 8,000 to 17,000 ton of ton of feed a week. So for an easy calculation, I'm putting about 10,000 ton of feed a week. And if we can save about a dollar 80 in each ton of feed, that is about eighteen thousand dollar a week, and you know, you know, a year it's almost about a million dollar. So that is a huge cost that could be saved in the feed, but also help to reduce the crude protein. So you have a two way benefit of those. But here is where we go. If we go back further to fifth, we could still save money, but as we go down there, you can see your arsenine is going from one thirteen all the way to one hundred five. And this is where I'm going to go in the next slide. If you do not balance those fourth, fifth, and sixth limiting amino acid, and if you let it, let it fall to 100, it will still save you money in your paper, but it has fallen down from 113 to 100. That's a 13 point drop of arginine in your paper. And that is going to show by reducing the feed conversion ratio, by reducing the body weight gain of the birds, and your bird are going to suffer. So the key is you can save the money by using fourth or fifth limiting amino acid, but you have to balance your amino acids here. If you don't balance those, you could save money on a paper, but you will not save money on real life because you lose money at the back end of the birds when they go to the processing plant. So that is a neat balance that a nutritionist will have to play, looking at what is the cost of their corn, soybean, fat, the amino acid that they buy in, what is the ratio they are comfortable with and how far they can go before they think that they will lose performance. And that will dictate your fourth, that will dictate your fifth, and that will dictate how far you can go and your cost saving as well. So we discussed about opportunity for fourth, fifth, and sixth, but what are fourth, fifth, and sixth for our limiting amino acid and why do we need to understand about those? In the chicken world, the first is usually methionine, the second is lysine, third is threonine. <laughs> Excuse me. And I've already told that I'm not going to talk about all three of those because you all already know, or most of us already have dealt with that in our diet. What we'll talk about is the fourth, fifth, and sixth limiting amino acid in the diet. And what is the fourth, fifth, and sixth? It depends. It depends on the species of the bird or uh, species you are looking at. Even in the even in the poultry, you, if you look at the broiler or layers or turkey or quail or ducks. Your, your limiting amino acid could change. It could change on a, depending on your age, depending on the diet, ingredients, and ratios that you keep in. So all of these factors will play into what your fourth, fifth, and sixth is. But normally, they will be either branching or arginine or tryptophan. But they will reshuffle between each other. So we'll go into each of them as we have more time here to discuss it, OK? The first one we'll discuss is branch and amino acid. So what is a branch and amino acid? The branch and amino acid are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And most of the time, the fourth limiting amino acid or the fifth limiting amino acid will be either valine or isoleucine or sixth, depending on what ingredients you have and which animal you are looking at. But why am I talking about all three of them? Because when the diet goes to the stomach of the birds, the enzyme is not going to say, oh, you have more valine or isolation, so I'm just going to chop it off. The 
enzyme that translates this brain chain to alpha ketones and it changes to thiester, which is a process of catabolizing those amino acids. These two enzymes that you're looking at, BCAA transaminase and BCAA dehydrogenase, this will chop off all three of them. So imagine you have just enough of others two and you have too much of one. What that will do is it will create a negative imbalance. So the reason I'm bringing all three of them here is if you only remember only one point from this brain chain, what you have to remember is you have to balance all three of them. You cannot add too much valine or too much isolation or too much leucine. If it becomes an imbalance, it is better to have all three of them lower than have two low and one high. So that's the only gist of this presentation uh, on the brain chain that I'm gonna describe in a couple of lectures here or a couple of slides here. So let's look at how does branch and imbalances occur or how does that occur? If we look at a soybean in your diet, which is a major protein ingredient for all of us, your blue bar is a leucine to lysine ratio. So leucine is one of the branching, right? And then, no, sorry, leucine to isolation ratio. And if you look at the orange bar, orange bar is the leucine to valine ratio. So what I'm trying to say is how much leucine do you have compared to your isolation and valine? because you want to have it balanced. In a soybean, you will have about 1.5 to 2. And remember, as you go from your starter diet to a finisher withdrawal diet, what happens? Your soybean amount decreases, your corn or your cereal amount increases because you're, you are providing more energy. So on those corn, what happens is there is more leucine than isolation, and there's more leucine than valine in the corn compared to soybean. If you look at DGS, it's even more. If you look at other ingredients that is commonly used in the United States, and I should find a rice bran here because rice bran is commonly used in our part of Nepal and, the, and India. So if we look at those numbers here, what you, what you can say is as we go from a starter diet to either a grower or finisher withdrawal diet where we use more cereals to increase the energy, your leucine level generally increases. And if you have your high leucine level, it creates a negative imbalance or it creates an imbalance in those brands here. But where is the leucine ratio in my diet? If we ask most of the nutritionists, most of the nutritionists do not know where the leucine ratio in the diet is. If we go back and look at the papers, the requirement for turkey or broiler is about 110 ratio of leucine to lysine. In uh, layers, people debate somewhere between 110 to 120. But how much we have in our diet, we never pay attention because most of the time our leucine is way higher than what we need or it is more than 110, so we don't have to worry about it. We always worry about lysine, methane, and threonine because they could be lower for us, but we never worry about leucine because leucine is always higher than what we require. But you all know the story of amino acid. Amino acid is a double-edged sword. If it is lower, it's going to hamper your performance. If it is too much, it's going to hamper your performance too. So let's look at the leucine number. In a turkey, the leucine can range from 115, 120 to 145, 150. So on a last diet, there is about 30 to 40 point higher or more leucine than it is required. What is the story for layers? The requirement is about 110 to 120. How much do we have? You know, pull it and start a grower, you may have a, more than 150. In the layers, you may have 175 to 190. And this is a United States case, and we use uh, heavy DDGS diets here. So, so it could be different for Europe because Europe uses heavy wheat diets, and wheat doesn't have as much of a leucine as, uh, as we do here when we use corn soybean DDGS based diet. So it all depends on the ingredients that you use as well. So if you are looking at the formulations after the lecture, please go ahead and look at what is your leucine ratio in the diet. And most of the time, go and check your ingredients too, because some of the time we haven't in, entered the leucine ratio in our ingredients. So your leucine could be only 135 and say, oh, I don't have to worry about it. Mine is 135. But you could be missing a leucine in your corn or you know rice bran or something and your leucine could be a different number than what you should have. 
in a broiler, requirement is 110. Starter, it starts about 120, 125, and you can finish somewhere between 140 to 160, depending on what ingredient and how much you are using. So what this tells us a story is normally when we formulate diet, our leucine level is way higher than what we require. But what is the impact of this on valine and oxidation? Because as we understand and use fourth limiting amino acid, our valine becomes tighter. And how do we balance that valine and oxidation to make sure that we don't have a negative impact of leucine? So we look at some of the negative impact of leucine. So this trial, we, we ran with Arkansas University and COB 500's uh, joint program here. So we, we were CSA, uh, University of Arkansas, COB 500, and a producer that produces about 30 million births per week. Um, so we, we had a four-way interaction here. And even before we started this trial, if you go to Kansas State University's website, there is about five to seven papers that has been done on the swine side to look at the same design or look at the same interaction of valine isolation and leucine. And what they found out was as leucine increases, that reduces the feed intake, that reduces the body weight gain of the pigs. And we were going to the field and we were seeing in some of the diets where they were using heavy DGS and in some of the diets where they were using heavy peanut meal, which is really low on isolation, both of those birds or both of the birds that are coming out of from those complexes feed meal were having a negative feedback or negative feed conversion ratio compared to the same nutritionist formula coming from a different feed meal. So we started to think is what we are seeing in the pig side, the same story on what we are seeing in the broiler side too. So we got together with Mike Kidd uh, at the University of Arkansas, and Dr. Kidd is a pioneer in research, been working in the ammunition side for a while. So we went with him and said, Dr. Kidd, this is what we are seeing on the peak side. This is what we are looking at in the field. What do you think? And he pulled up results from 1985 that Dave Burnham in South Africa did, and he said, you guys are exactly correct. If your isolation is lower or your valine is lower, you are going to suffer your performance. But we wanted to run a trial to understand what is the three-way relationship because none of the those kind of study that three-way relationship hadn't been done in the past so we ran a bunch of trials right now i think we are about six or seven trials um, on on similar scenario looking at different interaction and different a's different densities different programs validating that in the field so we are fairly confident in what we are looking at right now so this is one of the first trial that we did what we did was we looked at the three-way interaction you see here, we have valine from 65 to 85, isolation from 58 to 74, and leucine 110, 130, and 150. Why this level? Because 75 is a normal uh, breeder recommended ratio of valine to uh, lysine for, for COP500. Isolation, we kept uh, at 66, and then we went down and up, which is normally done in amino acid uh, trials. Leucine, we kept 110 because that's a requirement. We kept 130 as a middle point, and we kept 150 because that is the higher amount of leucine that we are seeing in our normal formulation here in practical diets. So when we look at the results, it became very clear for us. So this is a busy graph. So I just want to focus here on this x-axis where we are looking at 1.6, 1.58, 1 1.54. These are the feed conversion ratios. And you see three slices here. These three slices are different level of leucine, 110, 130, and 150. So pay attention to this end of the, the slide where there is a fit conversion ratio number, 1.54, 1.58, 1.56. And if I have a really low isolation and really low valine, which is a really negative imbalance, you can see how the leucine affects. In 110, this is the lowest slice of the bar, your feed conversion ratio is about 1.55. If your leucine in the diet goes from 110 to 130, you can see your feed conversion ratio goes to above 1.59. Your leucine goes from 130 to 150, your feed conversion ratio goes to 1.6. So if you have the same amount of isolation in valine, which is really imbalanced here, but you increase your leucine from 110 to 150, your feed conversion ratio goes from about 1.55 to 1.6. 
That is a five point feet conversion ratio difference. Can you imagine a 7 million bird per week losing about five point feet conversion ratio just because of lice leasing? That's a lot of money. And that is where we started to look at, man, there is, there's a lot of things interacting here. How do we balance three of them? And we ran another trial and what we found out was Valium was more powerful on either improving the body weight gain or feed conversion ratio when leucine was imbalanced compared to isoleucine. So in this trial, what we did was we kept two levels of isoleucine. We kept five levels of valine because we wanted to find out what valine was exactly doing. And then we kept two levels of leucine, 115 because that's a requirement, 145 because that's what the normal practical diet leucine to lysine ratio is in here in the US. So what we found out was very amazing. And, and this was exactly what the big boys found out too. Here on your left graph, you're looking at a green line. This green line is 145 leucine to lysine ratio, which is a higher leucine to lysine ratio, which is a normal practical diet, okay? If you look at a orange line here, this orange line is leucine to lysine 115, which is the requirement of the bird. If I take you to X axis here at 60, if my valine to lysine ratio is 60, which is very low, nobody does formula says that, but just for the illustration purpose, if my valine to lysine ratio in my diet is at 60, look at my body weight gain. If I, my leucine to lysine ratio is at 145, my body weight gain is here. If my leucine to lysine ratio is 115, my body weight gain is here. By having the same valine ratio, this body weight gain differs depending on what your leucine to lysine ratio is. This is where you see the difference on the blue screen. To increase my body weight gain from here all the way to this orange circle, what I have to do, if I increase my valine from 60 to 74, my body weight gain increases from 1.35 to 1.45. But in a green bar, if you look at green bar, in order to achieve the same response of that bird, my valine has to go to 81. You see the difference? If my leucine to lysine ratio is 115, I can achieve my maximum performance at 74 valine to lysine. That is the orange bar here, the orange circle. But if my leucine to lysine ratio is 145 in my diet, which is a practical diet, now in order to achieve the same orange bar for this green bar or for this green circle, I have to go all the way to almost 79.80. So this leucine dictates what your valine to lysine ratio in your diet should be. It is all not negative. The positive impact is, you see this ratio, you can achieve a higher body weight gain by also increasing the valine. So you need, you need to harness the benefit of leucine and balance valine accordingly in order to pro maximize your, your gain for those birds. So this is a game that you play by balancing three-way amino acid ratios, okay? So those were all in cob birds. So the question came from the Ross side, right? What does a Ross bird do? Does the Ross bird behave the same as a cob bird? So we proposed the idea to Avision. So we partnered with Avision CZ and one of the customer, and, and we did a trial together with Auburn University. In this one, we went, a different route. There was a very, very intelligent person from Avision who brought up this idea. I hadn't known this idea before. This is a central composite design where you have five level of valine, five level of leucine, and five level of isoleucine. So that is five by five by five. If you do a five by five by five factorial, that's 125 treatment. There is no way you can run 125 treatment with enough replications to find a good trial. So what we did is if we have a central composite design, instead of having 125 treatment, you could have only 20 treatments. And what you could do is if you look at treatment one to 14, we chose different points of valine, different points of leucine, different points of isolation. And if you look at from 15 to 20, it is exactly the same. So what a central composite design is, the work of it just finished. So everybody knows football. Remember football. So in a football, your 15 to 20 is the center point that's inside the ball. It has to be solid because that center dictates how the ball moves. And your treatment one to 14 is the surface of that ball. So if your center is solid, 
your surface will be perfectly circular. And what you can do is you can rotate that ball and it will be even in every direction. So what that means is if your center is tight, which is 15 to 20, what you can find out is you can find out the three-way interaction of all of this. So instead of having 125 treatments, you could get away with 20. And that is the central composite design model that we used for this trial. And in this one, um, I'm not going to go on a lot of details. This is very busy slide. So what you need to know is, as I show you different graphs for the illustration purpose, I'll show you two. And I'll show you three more here. Every graph is Lewis to Lysen ratio. So this one is 110. The next one I'm showing is 130, okay? On the top side here, you will see a valine ratio, valine to lysine ratio, ranging from 64 to 88. On your left bar here, this y-axis, you will see 56 to 78, that is our RICDC. And the bullseye is where you want to hit for the maximum performance. So 110, listen to license ratio, you could be somewhere between 74 to 82 on valine, somewhere between here and isolation, and you could hit a bullseye. That's your red bar here. Is your listen to license changes from 110, which is the requirement to 130, you don't have a right red bar anymore. So the maximum or the best you can get is the yellow bar because that leucine has already taken away your body weight gain capacity. But even to get that, what you have to do is look at these pictures here. 130, this is 150, this is 170, this is 190. 190 is almost impractical for a broiler, but this is a model that we created. So what is the difference you see? As you go from the first bar graph here, 110 all the way to 30, 50, 70, 90, this circle is moving towards your right and low. What does that mean? As your leucine level increases in your diet, you have to increase your valine and you have to increase your isolation in order to balance your extra leucine into the diet. So all three of these are a moving piece. This is not like a lysine where I say, okay, my lysine and my starter should be 1.21. What is your valine in your starter? The next question should be, what are the ingredients you are using? How much is your leucine in the diet? And how much is your isolation in the diet? That is going to impact your valine in your diet. So this is a moving piece as we, as we are understanding more. This is a bar graph that presents the same thing. So here, when I'm playing this video, what you will see is this is a body weight gain for 20 to 40, 34 days of birth, okay? Here, I have like 900 grams all the way to 1300 grams. What I'm doing here in this number here is losing to license ratio, I'm keeping at 145. That is an average losing to license ratio for a US standard diet for rulers. Isolation, I'm keeping at 64. That is a breeder recommended guideline. What I will do, valine, I'll, I'll, I'll increase valine from 62 all the way to 78, 84. 77, 76 is the breeder recommended guideline. Most of the US industry formulates on 78 because of the lucian ratio. But what I'm illustrating you is as I increase my valine from 62 all the way to 81, what happens to the body weight gain? This video is going to show. So let's look at this video. So you see here, I'm moving this cursor from 62 all the way to 65, 68, 69, 70. And you can see how this bar graph has moved from 900 gram all the way to 1300 gram. Now I'm at 77. Let's see what happens when I go to 84. So now I'm moving from 77 to 80, 81, 85, 86. What happened? As I move from 62 all the way to 79, 70, 80, that body weight gain or that capacity to increase the body weight increased. But as I went from 81 to 82 to 85 to 86, that body weight gain went down again. Why? Because now I'm supplying too much valine. So too much valine is not a good thing either. The key is the balance of all three of them. So the next one is a leucine. So here, what I'm trying to show you is leucine, I have 105, which is just below the requirement level, okay? Valine, I'm keeping at 75, a breeder recommended guideline. Uh, Isolation, I'm keeping at 64, which is a breeder recommended guideline. What I'm trying to show you is what happens when you increase leucine from 105 all the way to 180, 190. This number will change as I increase or as I play this video. What you have to see here is if you look at this red, this is a perfectly balanced valine isolation leucine. So if you do a really good job of balancing the branch chain, your capacity to increase or your capacity to get a body weight gain is 1300. 
if we do a really bad job, which is the four corners, our capacity to do a bad job is 1100. So a good job versus bad job, we have about how many gram differences? 200 gram. And that is where, when the leucine is 105. Let me play and take where the leucine should be 145 or 150, because that's a practical diet, right? So now I'm going to increase my cursor from 110, 115, 119. See how this curve has started to change. 132, 140, 145. Sorry, 145. So what happens when I go to 145? Okay, my solution is 145 now. If I do a really bad job, where am I right now? Almost at 850, 900 gram. What is the best job? 1300 gram. So now I am about 400 gram difference between doing a really good job and a really bad job of balancing the branch chain. When my lucian is 145. When my lucian was at 105, my good job versus bad job was only 200 gram difference. So what I'm trying to say is as the lucian increases in your diet, if we do not balance those three branch chain, the negative impact is higher as the lucian increases in your diet. Okay, let's move forward if I can move this slide. Give me one second. Sorry guys, my slide has frozen here. So let me see if I can. Sorry about that. I may have to start the presentation again. Okay, hopefully this runs this time. Okay, we were here. Perfect. So, so that is the case of balancing the brand chain. And that is only on performance. When we ran trial with Dr. Kidd at Arkansas, 30% of the birds showed this kind of symptom here. And we had about 13% valine deficiency. And this comes not only for broiler, but also breeders and layers. Those who do nutrition on breeders and layers, if you see the feather, which is very ruffled and concaving away from the body, you can go and check at your leucine level. And most of the time, your leucine level is way higher and it's the balance branch and it's not balanced. And that can cause almost 30% of the bird will have this kind of symptom versus a normal bird. And this is not only done by University of Arkansas. There was a study on from Australia, University of New England Armidale. The team did that research and looked at the deficiency of valine or oscillation or leucine in their diet and looked at the feather condition. And the feather condition was extremely poor when the branch chain was not balanced or deficient. Why that happened? What we also did from the trial I showed you at Avision is a team picked out the feathers from there and did a complete analysis of the feathers. They took the breast muscle and they did a complete gene expression of the breast muscles. We haven't finished the gene expression analysis yet because we did 27,000 protein sequencing from those genes. And, and we have three abstracts that we are presenting this January, but we are still working on those gene expressions to understand what happens with the muscle accretion on interaction of branching because branching actually helps on muscle accretion. A lot of bodybuilder drink branching or lesion to increase their muscles. But what happens to the birds, we do not know. So we, we have those genes that has been sequenced and we are going to study and hopefully in about six months, we'll know the further detail. But the feathers data are out. And what feathers data say is, if we have a feather problem, most of the time, what we say is increase your methionine. But if your branching is imbalanced, methionine is not going to do anything at all. You see a picture here? When you're leaching to lysine is at 145, your methionine is flat. It doesn't matter whether you increase your leaching or oscillation or valine methane is not gonna move. But the interesting thing is the cysteine is gonna move. When leucine to lysine is at 110, there's not much difference. But the leucine to lysine goes to 185, you can see as you increase your valine, your cysteine level in the feather increases. And cysteine is what that disulfide bone creates the feather of better structure. 
And this is not only our research. If you go back to 1992, a Farron and Thomas paper, what they did was they looked at the valine deficiency on feather pattern. And if you look at those two respects here, the crude protein or VDD, VDD is a valine deficient diet. With what that does is it has higher leucine, higher isolation, and low valine. BCD is a branch and deficient diet. So you have deficiency of all three of them. So you have lower on all three. And then VSD is the valine sufficient diet, which means you have increased the ratio of all three of them according to what you need to be. And you can see a crude protein is lowest on a valine deficient diet. It is better to have all three of them lower than having two higher and one of them lower. That creates an even more negative antagonism. And then once you have all three of them higher, you're going to 88. What it did to a cysteine, unfortunately, I do not have a data for BCD, which is the lowest, um, all of them. But you can see a valine deficient diet has 7.04. As you increase your valine into the diet, your cysteine level increased as well. So this was not a new data that we discovered in 2022. Somebody in 1992 already did that in a three-week-old three male broiler and had published that results already. We didn't look at it in 1992 because at that time, valine and isolation were as expensive as gold. Right now, there's a feed grade form that we can use and balance the branchings. The other effect that kind of surprised us was uh, leg problems. About 10% of the birds that we did on the trial had a leg deficiency. If you look at this, most of the time we'll see either it's Newcastle or vaccine reaction or, or calcium phosphorus problem or, or it gets. We opened some of those birds and we saw scoliosis on the, on the backbone as well. The backbone was not really developed. If you look at the bony structure here, it's more cartilaginous versus more skeletal and a normal. The vet that was attending uh, this postmortem, and, and this was a university vet, he said we should analyze our feed because our calcium or phosphorus could be lower on those diets apart from just uh, amino acids. So we did the proximate analysis. Guess what? The calcium and phosphorus came exactly to be the same on both the diet. The only difference in them was the brand chain was imbalanced. So why does branching imbalance play a role on skeletal calcium deposition? So we went back and we started to look at the research. And the same person in 1992 who did, who did the feather research also looked at why that happened. And if you look at BCD, BCD is the lowest of all, but it's balanced. VDD is where you have two more, but valine is deficient. And then the third bar graph here is all of them are higher to balance that. You see your dry bone weight, it's already low. So it's better to have all three of them lower than having leucine and isolation high and low value. Bone S, percentage of the dry bone, is the same story. He also looked at bone calcium Mg per dry bone. The calcium is lower on those valine deficient diet. And at that time, they looked at the fractional excretion of calcium in the urine or through the cloaca. And the, when they looked at that, the valine deficient diet had the highest excretion of calcium through the urine. So that calcium pathway that recirculates and takes back to the blood or bone, it was actually excreting the extra calcium. So no matter how much calcium you provide from the diet, it was not actually going to the bones or the, or the blood. It was actually excreted from the urine pathway or the or the ureolytic pathway for the birds. So this is a story on the broiler side, but what is on the layers? Most of the time, our layers ratio for valine to lysine is this one. I dig some information just to understand is this story true on layers too? Because layers, nobody has done research. CZ has a project in about seven to eight months, we'll understand what is the ratio of those three or what is the interaction of those three in all three phases because we are currently running trials with the professor. But I found two papers that were looking at valence ratio. There's no three-way interaction, but there's, this is just looking at valence optimal ratio. And I found out that there was a 208, 2008 paper that said it should be 93% in Highland W36. In same Highland W36, in 2019, 
The researcher said, the other researcher that published the paper in Polish Science said the optimized for egg mass is 89, hen house production is 85. It's four point lower. Normally what happens is the bird gets more productive. Most of the time the requirement usually goes higher, but in this case it was four point lower. So we didn't know what it was. It was just a fluke or it was a experimental variation. So we went and started to look at the diets. So if you look at two diets here, what do you see? The difference on the left, that is corn, soybean, meat and bone meal, uh, vase oil. On the right, you see corn, peanut meal, and soy oil. So we started to calculate what is the leucine to lysine ratio. The leucine to lysine ratio of the, on your left is 184. The leucine to lysine ratio on your right is 116. This exactly fits with what story we told on the broilers right now. Because your leucine to lysine ratio is lower, you don't need that much vein in here. But if your leucine to lysine ratio goes from 116 to 184, you better increase your valine as well, maybe by four points or maybe by three points, depending on what your ratio is. So the layers kind of tells the same story, but I do not have that in one trial to show like what I showed you in the broiler side too. So we are currently running a trial, maybe in six months or eight months, we get back together and I could, I could present you the trials that we saw on the layer side too. But the story kind of feels the same. The story was same for the pigs. The story was same for the broilers. If you do turkeys, go back and look at the turkeys 1979 data from West Virginia University. It's not a three way interaction, but it's a two way interaction. It tells the exactly the same story. The layers from these two papers from 2008 and 19 tells exactly the same story. So the poultry and the swine are speaking the same story on branch and amino acid balance. So to end this uh, section of branching, let me review it again. What is the leucine ratio in your diet? Requirement is 110, you could rinse on turkey from 115 to 145. Layers, you could go from 115, 120 to 190, depending on what ingredients you are using in your diets. In broilers, you could go from 125 to 150. So the implication of this, what I showed you for branching before moving to arsenic is, Typically, as the bird goes from smaller to higher or starter to finisher, your leucine ratio in the diet automatically changes. If you want to reduce the leucine, normally that is more of an expensive way. The better way is to balance your valine, isolation, and leucine in the diet by adding either valine or isolation or, or looking at other alternate ingredients that can balance all three of them. Properly balancing the branch and amino acid improves your feed compression ratio, helps with feathering, improves the light performance at feed intake. And what we have found is valine kind of pushes the light performance and intake, leucine pushes the breast mediate. So it is the nutritionist's job to understand, are they looking for breast meat? Are they looking for bigger birds? Are they looking at feed intake? And you balance your branch and depending on what your system is looking for. So let's move on to arsenine. Arsenine, why arsenine? Because arsenine could be another fourth, fifth, or sixth limiting amino acid or seventh limiting amino acid, depending on what your ingredients and ratios are. So I'll be very quick on arsenine because we are short on time. Um, so arsenine is a multifaceted. If you look at arsenine in humans, there's ton of research, ton and ton of research on gut health, on fertility, on energy metabolism, on the poultry side, we did not have a lot of research because we didn't have arsenine per se in a synthetic form, but now we do. So let's look at what happens. The first is the energy metabolism pathway. The second one is the ornithine pathway that works with GI integrity, immune cellular function, the growth or regrowth of DNA, RNA. And then the third aspect is the nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is still a mystery box, even for the human nutrition side. It helps on lipogenesis, it helps with body fat deposition, it helps with new transmitter process. And there's a lot of research that is still unknown on what nitric oxide pathway can do to the body. But there are papers in poultry as well that has been elicited that nitric oxide pathway of arsenine actually helps with reducing the body fat, increasing the carcass quality, and, and, and some of the gut health function as well, which I will show you in this diet. 
I'm not going to go and spend a lot of time on the requirement because you can go and look at the papers and, and read requirements. Um, that was not the gist of the trial. We were just trying to look at the functional benefits. But the reason I'm putting this here is this is a paper that was published in 2012 where we, Avizin and Auburn together in a trial um, has been published in Poetry Science. So you can go back and look at the entirety of those trials in details. But what I was trying to show is if you look at the breeder guideline, the breeder recommended guideline is 107 of leach to license, um, arsenic to license ratio. But when we ran the trial for 25 to 42 days of performance, the arsenic to lysine optimum ratio came to 115, 116, and the body weight gain came to 130. So what we kind of think is, is the board ages from 25 to 42 days of age or around 18 to 20, 18 to 35, 40 days of age, the arsenic requirement is really high on the boiler side. And this is one of our colleagues who did a meta-analysis on 94, observations and what it did was if you look at the body weight gain here on your x-axis and on your y-axis you look at this um, growth the green bars here is the finisher phase the pink bar is the sorry the green bar is the starter phase the pink bar is the grower phase and the blue bar is the finisher phase you look at the starter and grower as your sid arginine intake increases your body weight gain increases as well so there's a linear relationship almost linear relationship of how much arsenine that body is in, taking and how much body weight gain that is achieving. The another aspect of arsenine is the egg production because it works on with the nitric oxide pathway, helps in fertility with hatchability of the breeders, and also helps with improving the quality or the, the, um, the production of eggs. So we did two pair house trial on COP500 by M99 breeders. Um, this is a field trial, it's a pair house trial, so it's not a lot of replication. It's a two house where you have about five to 15,000 birds in one treatment, five to 15,000 birds in another treatment. You track them for, for 20 to 30 weeks of age. In this one, we, we track this for 15 weeks of age. We looked at what, where they were before and what, where they were after we started treating the birds. What we saw was when the birds, there were no arsenine, there was no increase in hatching eggs or hatchability. As we increased that arsenine ratio in those diets, it increased the hatching eggs uh, per hen. It also increased the hatchability of those eggs in the first trial. So if you look at the graph here, this is, this is the line where we started the arsenine feed. The blue bar that you see is the egg production without arsenine and the red bar is the egg production with arsenine. The hatchability is the same. The hatchability is mixed up to here. Then as we started increasing the arsenine, the hatchability kind of went up, which is the orange bar here with arsenine and then the blue bar with, uh, without arsenine. So that was very interesting for us, but that was when we started for the last 15 to 20 weeks. So the producer said, man, I won't repeat this for the whole flock and see if this was just a fluke or can we repeat this and get the same numbers. So we did this for a full cycle from 25 week all the way to 4, 64 week of age. I cannot tell you the exact number because this is a producer's data and, and I'm not allowed to share the exact concentration of the, of the diet. But what we did was we increased the arsenine concentration of theirs from and, and took it to somewhere between 1.1 to 1.15, the diastole arsenine ratio. And what we found out was by adding those arsenine, we had about 3.4% increases in chick for hen, and we got about six hens per egg, or six eggs per hen benefit by you adding arsenine. However, on the hatching side, we did not see any difference in the second trial. So when we ran the economics for those, because at the end of the day, it all comes to money, the cost for a diet for us when we increased on the breeder diet was about ten dollar a ton increased cost if it is a hundred thousand birds or a million bird complex which is a fairly small complex for the united states they use about 600 ton of breeder feed a week and this is according to agri stats report if you increase one percent egg, uh, egg numbers that is worth about one hundred seventy five thousand dollars. so if you increase the number of chicks per hundred hands by one it's worth about this much money so what we did was we did trial one and trial two, and we calculated the ROI depending on what the production was, what was the hatch, 
and what is the total benefit for that farm during that period and the roi was almost about two to three percent uh, or about roi was about the ratio was about two to three so that was a good deal for them so they went from one complex to having that in the six complexes right now and we are in the third year of looking at ours in the end we are still having a positive impact on those but it is not only about breeders it is also about broilers on on what we can look at as we grow the birds more the white stripings the woody breast is a real issue so as we increase ours into the diet there was lesser number of white stripings there was lesser number of spaghetti meat and there was lesser number of woody breast not a lot or significant numbers on the wooden breast but in the white stripings and spaghetti meat we could see a statistical response where by increasing the arsenine ratio you're getting less severe lesions of white stripings in spaghetti meat as well and this was not a trial that we ran this was a trial that a european colleagues ran and published independently the ratios they used was 105 which is the requirement uh, 125 or 135 125 135 is almost impractical for us to take to that ratio because the cost of the field will be astronomically high but this was a research for them to show that if you reach this level there's a potential for ours need to work and it works from the same pathway that we discussed earlier on the nitric oxide side the other interesting avenue of arsenine has been gut health because gut health has always been an interesting avenue with arsenine and threonine because a lot of people if we look at threonine the mucin production the intestinal lining and threonine is very closely related another amino acid that has already always been under shadow and not been discussed more is arsenine arsenine directly helps with gut integrity now this is a trial that was run at university of georgia independently not from us uh, so i looked at this paper from from one of my colleagues here when you are looking at data your blue bar is the challenge bird with coccidiosis so they challenged the bird on day 12 five days after challenging they fed a fitzy what fitzy is is a chemical that you can feed to the birds if the intestine is very tight that fitzy is not going to get absorbed in the blood if the intestine is loose or your your there are pores or your tight junction is not as tight then the fitzy will leak into the gut and it will go to the blood so the more you see in your blood the worst your intestine is okay so see here between a blue bar and a and an orange bar the blue bar is a challenge bird with coxie and orange bar is an unchallenged bird obviously in every level you are seeing the blue bar has a higher fitzy which kind of tells us that as you challenge through coxie your intestinal linings are getting poor and we all know that already but what is even more interesting here is look at just the blue bar and look at the numbers this 88, 96, 105, 113 is the arsenine to lysine ratio. So as we increase the arsenine to lysine ratio from 88 to 96 to 105 to 113, this FITC number decreases almost linearly, which means that it is making the intestine tighter or reducing the effect of coxy. I don't know which one it is because we they haven't given us the internal physiological response. But what they have shown the data is arsenine kind of helps with tightening the gut or interrupting the protozoa somewhere. Then when you go to 122, then you start to see a quadratic response again. Now you have too much and you have a negative impact. So we had that trial and then we repeated that in a swine side because you all know that swine suffers from scars and, and diarrhea in the first uh, few weeks of days when they are wind. So what they did was they fed through water or feed or both of the applications. And then when you look at uh, day seven and day 21, they had 0%, 4%, 8% through water, 12% through water, and then 1.3, 1.5, 1.7 is through feed. So as you feed water, your lactulose to mantle level, this is almost like FITC. So what you do is you look at the blood, the lower the amount of lactulose mantle you have, the better that gun junction is. So as you increase from 0%, which is the first bar, a white bar, to 4% to 8%, that lactulose to mannitol is decreased, which means your gut is getting tighter. Then you go to 12%, it goes back up again. 
the interesting part was they only fed that water for for seven days and they looked at 21 days on that eight percent there was still a response so if you give that dose first and floss that got through arginine that has some impact up to 21 days of age and when they looked at and where the border 42 they were about a pound heavier so the implication of arginine is that if we increase the arginine ratio from 101, most of the people are in 101 to 110, 115, you increase the fecundation ratio or the body weight gain of the birds. You improve the intestinal barrier function. There's a better immune response. And there's a better postural growth as well. Vivek, how much time do I have? Well, you can go a long way. Okay, I'm, I'm almost done. So I was just trying to make sure that we have enough time for questions. So yeah. I'm wrapped up with arginine. I'm going to touch on tryptophan. Tryptophan is a very touchy subject, so I'm going to touch very less on this one, okay? Tryptophan, most of the time when you look at tryptophan, the peaks, the peak boys usually use a lot of tryptophan because that comes way earlier limiting them for us. But as we understand layers and breeders, Tryptophan is very essential for us. Maybe not as much for the broiler side, but if you look at breeders and, uh, and laying hens, tryptophan should come on a higher priority list for us because tryptophan, not only on the birds, but also in humans, peaks has been correlated to fear and anxiety through aggression, the behavior. And if you look at cannibalism or feather picking or feather licking, all of these are common characteristics that we hear on either breeders or, or layers. So understanding what tryptophan is, how much we have, how that behaves is extremely important. Because if you look at uh, Dr. Arjun's lecture yesterday, he said that corn is lower in tryptophan ratios. So normally if we feed high corn diets, you could be lower on tryptophan, maybe not too low, but to a point where you could start to have either cannibalism or, or anxiety or, or piling up responses on smaller bullets. So you have to understand those as well. This is a picture from aviation. What I'm showing you here is from zero to seven week or eight week of age, a broiler can go grow from almost 45 gram all the way to 10 or nine pound bird, which is about like four kg in cages. But our dad and mom or the breeders that we raise, a male breeder will reach the same weight, which is about eight pound in 23 weeks. How we do that? We do that by controlling the feed, obviously, right? A female, to reach the same age, we take about 41 weeks of age. So the bird that has a capacity to reach eight pounds in seven weeks, we take about 23 or 41 weeks to reach the same age. And we do that because we want our birds to be agile, we want our birds to be fertile, we want our birds to be mating and producing eggs regularly. But in doing so, there is a double-edged sword because every year these birds are getting efficient. They are more responsive to nutrients. They are growing faster. They are growing more efficiently. But at the same time, you want a breeder that should not grow as fast, that should be lean and thin, that should be sexually active, and that should produce eggs regularly for us. So where is the where is the point where it will be a happy medium? It's a it's a stress or it's a, it's a struggle for, for the geneticist and it's a struggle for the nutritionist too. But what does that do to us as a field nutritionist? As the board are more responsive to nutrients, the cleanup time becomes less. The nutrient carving is more because the board, expand, board had the capacity to grow more. As a result of that, the bigger boards will eat faster, the smaller boards will be pushed aside. Especially in, in North America, uh, in South America and Asia, we have manpower where we can move the birds in the breeder house, we can raise uh, less denser population. But in US, we don't have as much manpower. So a lot of things are automated and we don't have manpower to move the birds. So the bigger birds will always get a higher portion of the feed and the smaller birds will get a small portion of the feed or there will be much um, less movements of those birds around the cages which creates a uh, lesser uniformity in the birds that creates a behavioral issue, which will be feather licking or feather picking or cannibalism, depending on which stage you have. All of that will create in reducing the egg production hatchability and the growth issues as well. And all of this is a loss for a producer. It's a headache for the nutritionist and it's a headache for the farmer as well. 
how do we control that? And one of the things that we can look at is tryptophan because tryptophan, we, we have done some really good trials that I cannot show now because we are still on the phase of finishing it with a producer. And normally a producer uses for four to six months before we can bring that out to the audience. Uh, but some of the trials that we have seen is astonishing on, on the level of tryptophan and how they have behaved with the breeders. This is one of the trials that we did in Texas a and just to understand does tryptophan do anything. So what we did was we dumped from zero pound to all the way eight pound of tryptophan in a diet and wanted to see if there's a response, is there a response? And we did both an A-Vision and COP works. So if we look at a body weight gain, COP didn't respond much to tryptophan on body weight, but Rossberg did. But what was opposite was the in the uniformity side, the birds that were treated with tryptophan on COP birds were more uniform and they were more responsive to be more uniform than the Ross birds. What was astonishing is on both the COP and Ross birds, as we increased the level of tryptophan from one to two pound, four and eight were flat. So there's no point going above two, but as much as two pound using the tryptophan, we saw tonic immobility response. What is tonic immobility response? You catch a bird, you put it in the table, hold it for 10 seconds and leave the bird. And you count the amount of seconds, the bird will start to move after you leave it. That is a welfare response that most of the scientists in, in the literature world that work with uh, birds behavior uses to look at how stressed the bird is. The more stressed the bird is, it's going to sit on that position longer. The less the bird is, stre is stressed, it's going to move faster because it thinks that, okay, there's no prey, I can move, I can, I can go and do my own things. So you can see as you increase your tryptophan, there is less tonic mobility on those birds or, or there's an improvement of the stress response as well. We also collected the blur to look at the corticosteroid level to serotonin level, and, and we have those in labs. In the field trial, it came in and, and it came really, really different uh, on the birds or the female birds that were fed with tryptophan versus the female birds that were not fed with tryptophan. And the amount of uh, serotonin on the skipper day versus the fed day was very, very different. So it was, it was really interesting to look at that. If we look at the laying hands, most of the time when we formulate diet here in the US, our tryptophan is right around 17 to 19. But if we look at the requirement, the requirement should be above 21 in order to have a better response. So the some of the nutritionists that I work with, um, there are three nutritionists I work very closely with. Uh, one of them have a 40 million birds. Uh, the other two look at uh, under 10 and 20 million birds uh, in their consulting role. Uh, what they do is, especially on the pullet side, if there's a flight rate response or if there's a piling of mortality, they tend to increase their origin into 20, um, the tryptophan to 2021, and that kind of solves the problem for, for them together with the other management issues that they have. And if we look at two research that has been published recently in 2019 and 2020, both of them shows on a quadratic broken line model that at least the tryptophan should be above 20 or 21. Uh, for the laying hands as well. There are some research on the feather picking behavior as well. If you increase the tryptophan or if you decrease the tryptophan, it increases the feather picking behavior of the birds. So here you can see a uh, black bar is a control, white bar is the tryptophan. This is the frequency. As you increase your tryptophan, the number of um, feather picking on a low feather picking line, and high feather picking line, it decreases on a gentle feather picking as well as in a severe feather picking. And looking at the feather feeding time, you can see the feeding time increases. And that is what I said in the breeder side too. It is extremely important that you increase your feeding time as the birds get more carving to the bird, to the feed. By increasing the feeding time, you allow the smaller birds to get a chance to go and get feed into the feeder before it gets empty again. This is a research that was done in Canada, uh, University of Guelph, and they published this research in 2019. And what it shows is if you have an acute tryptophan depletion, what happens to the repetitive behavior of the birds? How many times do they pick? If you deplete the tryptophan, which is the gray bar, your picking per minute increases in both the research. So what it says is, as your tryptophan level goes down, the, fed, the bird's aggressive behavior or the picking behavior or the abnormal behavior kind of increases. 
So that is all I have for tryptophan. Um, mostly we look at serotonin and corticosteroid to look at how the tryptophan in influences the stress level of the birds. Uh, there are other functional properties that uh, tryptophan has worked on, especially come looking at the stress, especially of environment or vaccines or disease or feed. And it also influences the behavior on anxiety and, and aggression as well. So that is all I have for the presentation today. Uh, we go back and close the case. I presented this case at the start of the meeting and I said, what would you do next? Any thought process and what would you do next after looking at the case? Any thought process? Yes. Uh... You can feel free to unmute your microphone and and yeah, we let's make it a discussion. If you all have any thought process and what would you do in those case, uh, sir, uh, as the valine is increasing, we have to uh, make sure that leucine and isoleucine also move in the same way in a more balanced yeah. fashion. Very true. Very very true. Very good point. Any other points? Very, very true. And thank you for, for your answer. A couple of things I uh, we looked at as a team for that program. And, and, and right now we are where we wanted to be on that program. But what we wanted to look or what we looked at first thing was, this is your minimum spec, right? What is your formulatory spec? Because minimum spec could be one thing that you gave me. But what does your formula really have? That was the first thing we, we looked at. And we look, when we looked at the formula, this is what we found. Look at the arsenine level. This is the minimum requirement for them. So their minimum requirement is 100 to 101. And the formulated spec on program A, they are above 105, 102, 111, right? What happens in program B? They're about 105, which is already six points below that. It doesn't matter because if, you're, if your requirement is 105, you are still good. But as you go from grower to finisher to withdrawal, your level decreases from 105 to 99. That's a seven point decrease in arginine. And we already saw arginine in the slide that arginine requirement is at least 107. So they are lower on both directions, but this program B is extremely low. So that is one that we looked at. The second one, which the gentleman earlier said, you have to look at your valine, leucine, and isolation too. And we looked at isolation and arsenine because your valine is your fifth limiting amino acid. As you start to balance your fifth, your sixth and seventh limiting amino acid has to be balanced as well. Remember the barrel earlier? You raise the bar for five, but you don't raise a bar for six and seven, it's not gonna go higher, right? Program A raised the bar for all of them. Look at the isolation here. Isolation is 67 on finisher and withdrawal. In program B, the finisher withdrawal is 64. That's three points lower than what it should be compared to program A. And their minimum spec is 59. 59 is way lower than what it should be. The isolation requirement, according to breeder guideline, is 67. Even if you want to be at 63 or 65, this could have solved the problem. So their real issue was not balancing their fifth and sixth limiting amino acid and just balancing their fit. In real life, they were thinking, okay, man, I have about, you know, five to seven point higher valine ratios, I should be getting benefit, but their fifth, sixth and seventh limiting amino acid fell off. So understanding not only first, second and third, as you are working to your fourth limiting amino acid, looking at fifth, sixth and seventh and making sure that they are balanced is extremely important. So we, we, we tossed a little bit about balancing valine isolation and leucine, which kind of comes to this place as well. We tossed about fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh limiting amino acid, which could be branching, arsenine, or tryptophan, and this comes into play as well. So if you don't balance those, and most of the time what happens in the, in the, in the field is they say, okay, the big boys are not looking at minimum crude protein, so I'm gonna reduce my crude protein as well, or not have my minimum in my formulation. 
And when you formulate your diet, if your fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh limiting amino acids minimum spec is not as where it should be, your, your formula will have a really nice saving on the cost, but your body's gonna suffer like what we saw here. So that is all I have. I want to thank Vet Nepal uh, for giving the opportunity to come in front of you all and, and share some of the ideas. I want to thank the universities that we work here in the United States. Special thanks to Cobb and Avision because they've already always trusted us to do amino acid research with them. And the production nutritionist, I could not tell the name here because uh, they don't want, uh, most of the time they want to be anonymous on who we work with because of their competitive advantage. So, but I want to thank the production nutritionists who give us a chance to go and look at the birds with them, uh, work with them with the university and, and partner with uh, partner, have a four way partnership with them to do research that could be helpful for them uh, as well as the world. Uh, thank you. I'll take any questions you all have. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, in uh, in your experience, uh, I want to ask. Suppose uh, we are balanced. We are very sure that we are balancing seven or eight of those amino acids we are talking about. Means uh, yes. first three, uh, next three, and two are different. Means uh, after balancing seven or eight of these amino acids to full satisfaction, can we ignore the CP constraint from breeders? Are you talking about breeders or are I talking about poultry in general? I'm talking about commercial uh, commercial broiler feed. Suppose I'm balancing yes, all seven or eight amino acids we just studied, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. to my full satisfaction. So mm -hmm. is it okay now that I can ignore the crude protein uh, recommendations or it's, it is still some gray area over there? So here is a question or here is a, here is my thought process okay and this is not a straightforward answer if i have to go do a straightforward answer i would say yes but at the same time i would say no as well because it depends on how far low do you go if your crude protein is 21 and you are reducing about two percent or three percent in that process we have enough research to show that it should not be a problem the key that comes in as you start to do that process is how much non-bound versus bound uh, amino acid do you have? Because in order to balance your seven or eight to your full potential, you have to bring crystalline, right? And crystalline are way earlier observed than your bound amino acid through soybean or meat and bone meal or, or any other uh, macro ingredients. So how does the digestive dynamics of the bound protein versus inbound protein go? How far can you go? Uh, if you go to New England Armidale, there's a paper from Peter Sely, uh, Sonia Liu, that lab does extensive research on understanding the digestive dynamics of the bound versus non-bound protein. What they have gone so far is they have reduced at least four to 5% of crude protein and haven't had a problem. So the reason I'm saying yes and no is, if you are going at least up to three or four percent lower, I don't think there's a problem. If you are going above five or six percent crude protein, at certain point of time, what you will start to have is you have to have enough nitrogen into the diet to have a glycine serine response, to have a phenylalanine response, to have response for other amino acids that are non essential for the body as well. So how do we fulfill that nitrogen is a, uh, one question. The other question is, how do we balance a crystalline versus a bound amino acid? That is the only two question I have. Other than that, um, most of the U US industry nutritionists do not have a minimum CP on their formulation. If you look at swine in 2000, I think it was 1996, they had an NRC and in 2012, they had an NRC from that, 1996 up to 2012, there is a lot of research on swine side where they saw they can reduce up to two to three percent of crude protein and have an excellent benefit. If you go back and look at 2012 NRC on swine, there is nowhere minimum crude protein mentioned in any of the diets. What they mention is the total nitrogen they should have. And if we multiply that total nitrogen by 6.25, that crude protein level is at least three to four percent lower than what they had in 1996. So what I'm trying to tell is at least two to three percent. I'll close my eyes and do it. I'll put a eye. I'll I'll put my eyes on phenylalanine and glycine serine as I go that low. But we are at a stage in the United States where we are using fourth or fifth limiting amino acid. 
when I'm using fourth or fifth limiting amino acid, my crude protein reduces maximum to one or one and a half. And at that point, I'm not even worried about it. Sir, one more question. Uh, we have already discussed about most of the limiting amino acids. Just want your opinion on the growth and FCR aspect of 16. That is M plus C that I'm talking about. Uh, it, does it impact uh, the growth and FCR aspect significantly? or only the other aspects? Most of the time when you talk 16, methane and 16 come closer or together, right? We, we talked about methane and 16 and most of the time we have way more methane than we need. So uh, our general assumption is methane converts into 16 to cover. There are research where they argue that the methane to 16 conversion is not as efficient in some cases. So some of the customer has asked us to reproduce 16 by itself, especially the breeders uh, side of the world. And we haven't produced 16 by itself, but 16 has an important role on feather production, on, on growth in production as well. But most of the time, this methane and 16 are interrelated and it takes care of itself. But if there was not an interrelated conversion, then 16 would be definitely a point that everybody would be looking at. Okay, thank you nice. very much, Dr. Rusan Adhikari, for your wonderful, wonderful presentation. It might have been quite uh, complex to the people who never formulated uh, the diet uh, right. uh, on amino acid basis, but I'm sure the people who are actively working in feed formulation must have developed a greater insight to understanding the functional benefits of amino acid after this presentation. Some must be having queries in their mind. Please do feel free to put your questions in the chat box. But before starting with the Q and A that that are in the chat box, I have uh, bad news for you, and I am really sorry uh, because this happened because of our miscommunication. Our second presenter, Dr. Subhas uh, Sreshta, was supposed to present. Uh, is two lectures, uh, two talks. Uh, that was one was on today, 14th, 15th January, and the second lecture on the last day or the 19th January. Unfortunately, he thought that the both lecture were on was supposed to be delivered on 19th January. So it happened because of our miscommunication. In the meantime, I contacted today's. Uh, uh, Third presenter, third speaker, Dr. Dinesh Gautam, but unfortunately he is also busy in some work. He informed me that uh, he cannot give time uh, before 12.30. So we can elongate the discussion session, but no question and answer session. So I can, I, I would like to help Dr. Rusan to go uh, through the questions in chat box. Mm. There is one from Dr. Sunil Yadav. Are they digestible amino acid? Dr. Yadav, can you please unmute your microphone and make uh, clear for your question? Hello, hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are audible, please. Yeah, actually, uh, I just want to ask uh, because the uh, what level they are taken it is digestible or uh, it is total that that was my only query uh dr yadav uh, thank you for your question uh, most of the research that we have done here and i presented in the diets are all digestible amino acids uh, the case study i presented you however was a total amino acid thank you yes sir thank you thank you dr yadav he is a renowned poultry nutritionist uh, having more than 16 consultancies in Nepal and Northern India. And now there is yet another question from our senior Bharat Dai. Um, uh, you may unmute your microphone and put your question. Bharat, Bharat Raj Gautam, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek, sir. Uh, hello, Dr. Rosal, namaste. Mm, Baradai, Namaste. Very good to see you. Very good to very hear your voice. To, very happy to see you here. To, uh, In the meantime, I request uh, I request Dr. Adhikari to uh, uh, remove the 
presentation so that it would look more interactive yeah yeah please Varadhai, please go on okay so mm -hmm. uh, i'd like to have my question uh, i have written uh, in the chat box also uh, i just wanted to know that uh, is there any recommendation for uh, free range or pasture poultry regarding uh, uh, amino, limiting, limiting amino acid uh, and uh, uh, that uh, protein, uh, overall protein requirement for uh, New Hampshire, Bowen's brown and Isha brown uh, like poultry that are often reared uh, in uh, free range. Uh, so is there any uh, recommendation in, in, in the US? And Dr. Rosen, I would like to know that. Uh, thank you for your question. Um... I would like to ask a follow-up question to be more clear on this. Um, do you mean a free range means a backyard population or do you mean a commercial free range operation? Uh, normally free range means I wanted to refer uh, some 200 to 500 uh, poultry are kept uh, recently in Nepal also. I myself have uh, a farm, free range farm here in Petra. And uh, so I wanted to know that, uh, is there any special uh, recommendation uh, in the US for, is there be any breed-wise recommendation or uh, it, is, uh, it can be slightly lower than the commercial uh, poultry or just that like uh, that I wanted to know? So what we have right now, when we meet uh, here, the Highland and Lomen is actually promoted by the same, company or same umbrella and, and we have consulting nutritionists that we meet with them regularly to, on, to look at those. The guideline for the North America has come in two ways. One is a caged and one is um, not a free range, but aviary system, which typically is kind of uh, where the birds will move in the depletory system and they have different tires and they can, the birds usually moves. The consensus there, there hasn't been research um, on those, so I cannot tell it exactly, but the consensus among nutritionists who feed both the birds on the cage versus the birds on the aviary system, the consensus is they eat usually a little bit higher amount of feed. So if the feed intake is higher, they usually keep the same amount of nutrients that, mm. because at the end of the day, it's about how much MG of, amino acid intake per bird per day. Mm. But if your feed intake is constant, because it depends on the program, if your feed is like, okay, I'm gonna feed 100 gram a bird per day, no matter it's summer or winter or when, then your density of energy and amino acid is a little higher for the AVU resistant birds or the free range birds. We have some operations, which is called organic, free range and and the, some of the free range birds like you said here people move the fence in a pasture line in every seven to ten days and the birds get free access to pasture um the you know insects that come with the pasture and also they supplement them with feed in those cases also we tend to have a little bit more denser diet because the bird is moving more um but there's no specific okay. research that has described the, uh, the amount of research. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Bharat Dai. He is a livestock development officer working under livestock service department, uh, government of Nepal, and looking up after feeding and formulations in National Livestock Breeding Office, Pokhara. Thank you very much uh, for the question and for addressing the question, Dr. Radhikari, and uh, there is Santos Pantaji. Santos Pantaji, you, you may unmute your microphone and put your view or a question, whatever. Yeah, it was not the question, but I was just uh, uh, answering the uh, initial session that uh, only increasing the value of valine is not only the case, we should balance all the ratio all the um, ratio of uh, required amino acids very true very true i agree 100 percent on that thanks so are we finished with the questions if anybody like to 
okay yeah please Coach. please please go ahead uh, sir i want to uh, ask that uh, as i understand cj has vast of uh, information of amino acid a very detailed understanding so is there any forum or any website where uh, a common person like me can uh, uh, get those information at least some part of it which is offered to the open public so we can improve on the amino acid understanding a uh, very very good question dr singh um see as you know she is a global company so we have uh, technical service working in different part of the world and as a cj we produce monthly bulletins which bring stitch and bits of the research on those bulletins which you can go to cj's website and we started to post there from last year but um, some of the research that i have shown you today uh, is you know a collaborative approach of uh, the breeder here the customer here in university and our research pro or our research team so all the nitty gritty details hasn't been in the website but if you all want to look at it from time to time uh, i'm sure we have colleagues in india that look uh, on that direction or you can contact us and we will be more than happy to share or discuss anything that we all need uh, for us at the end of the day it's a knowledge if we share knowledge we all get wiser so so there's no i cannot give the specific data because of the proprietary information that cj or the company has but i am always happy to discuss learn from your experience and share what i see from here as well uh, okay sir uh, one uh, last question sir uh, uh, if uh, some uh, commercial layer or commercial broiler are exhibiting typical signs of tryptophan deficiency so uh, how uh, long it will take to show some improvement if we balance the diet and provide some sub supplementation one of the i don't have a lot of experience on that but i have two experiences on breeders we we had breeders that were flying sky high every time we entered the room and the nutritionists didn't know what was going on we analyzed the diets and the tryptophan was critically low we added tryptophan within 3 days we saw the symptoms so it takes somewhere between 48 to 70 78 hours for the tryptophan to release the the pathway of the uh, of the corticosteroid what people say is if the body is stressed and if you are looking at corticosteroid in a blood it can exhibit as early as 90 day uh, as early as 90 seconds but if it is a treatment through tryptophan it can take somewhere between 48 to 72 hours to exhibit the symptoms um but doctor saying as you know when those kind of symptom appears if you 100% know that it's a critical tryptophan level deficiency tryptophan alone can help it but if it's a management somewhere like lighting or there's a noise that's disturbing the birds or, or there's something else along with tryptophan which is stressing the birds more then you have to address both directions too so you have to look at multi dimensional approaches on those kind of cases okay the uh, first thing was saying yeah yeah please please go ahead yes sir sir in india uh, uh, now uh, these amino acids like arginine tryptophan valine they have made their way into the market and uh, uh, not very commonly but uh, sometimes we, we are able to use that but uh, it is still not uh, very economically viable so do you think uh, if during formulation if uh, price it's a least cost ration and it is not picking voluntarily by the software that is the requirements whatever we have offered are being met by some other sources do you still think that some supplementation might help or we have to wait for it to get more economical to to thought process here okay if your tryptophan is met by your diets then i don't think you have to worry about it but if you are trying to look at the serotonin response of tryptophan what we have seen on a breeder is the recommended level for breeder is almost i'm just telling numbers the intake will dictate this but 0.16 what we have seen the benefit on tryptophan in breeders especially the calming effect and longer feed intake time was 0.25 so that is almost 8 to 9 point higher 
on the functional benefit of tryptophan and that will cost money that will definitely cost money it is that that is never going to be a source to have a least cost formulation wise but what you are looking at is if i am spending ten dollars on tryptophan per ton of feed am i getting three more birds alive through the process and how many chicks can i get that's a decision that the producer and the nutritionist together will have to make but on a formulation side especially on layers if your ratio is right around 17 to 19 most of the time your macro ingredients is going to fulfill your tryptophan if you have a minimum cp which is higher then sometimes your tryptophan is almost at 21 because your tryptophan could be fifth limiting and fourth limiting is already above 100. so in that case you don't have to worry about tryptophan but if you are starting to use a fourth limiting amino acid in the diet your fifth or sixth which could be tryptophan could be lower and that's where you have to start looking at do i need to supply or supplement is there a benefit of that so so it's a process that you see on where you are using if you are using third i don't think you have to worry about it if you are starting to use fourth limiting amino acid in the diet which could be valine or isolation or tryptophan in layers then you definitely have to be worried about it uh, sir over here uh, usually when uh, we have to go for low cost feeds generally we compromise the isolation and valine tryptophan right. and arginine are uh, usually fine so is it worth uh, investing money over there through uh, normal uh, raw material or through supplementation of synthetic chemicals is it worth going for the that extra cost so my first thought is to go and balance isolation and valine even before tryptophan because you will get more money for your expense by balancing your isolation or valine before you balance tryptophan if your birds, especially on the pullet side, I'm not saying on the layers, if your pullet side is showing more flightier responses and you increase your tryptophan to 23, tryptophan to lysine ratio to 23, your tryptophan could be a fourth limiting amino acid. Uh, valine and isolation may not be your fourth limiting amino acid. So in that case, you have to look at your soybean and corn price versus tryptophan price and what is the shadow price and you all know this way more than me so look at the shadow price and see if the tryptophan supplementation through soybean will be cheaper or tryptophan supplementation supplementation through crystalline will be cheaper and i would advise you to do a list of formulation and use accordingly you know cj as a cj you know if i was a sales guy i would say use crystalline amino acid but as a nutritionist what I will say is do the least cost formulation, look at your shadow price of your corn or your protein ingredient and macro ingredient versus your versus your uh, tryptophan available at the feed uh, on, a, on a crystalline form and, and put it both in the feed formulation and see what uh, what brings you the cheapest form. Uh, use that at the end of the day, tryptophan is a tryptophan. Uh, sir, what we uh, means uh, uh, we completely agree with your data. But what we uh, see over here is that uh, usually uh, isoleucine and valine, when we reduce them, the, you get to see those problems like feather issues and etc. Yeah. There is uniformity issue. But uh, the actual uh, body weight and FCR, uh, you know, it will get hampered uh, after some time when we go true down. So, true. Uh, very true. That is why uh, it is a very uh, difficult question whether or not to go for those isolation and balancing, will it be cost viable or not? Does it have uh, too much impact on body weight and FCR, which is the main uh, criteria that we have to to over here? I will, I will show, I think I showed you this data earlier, right? Let me, let me show this data to you again here. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm boring you guys up here with this one, but you see this picture here? This is 13% valine deficient diet. And this is not only because of valine deficiency, this is because of having too much leucine. If we look at our layers leucine, and, and I don't know if you all look at your layers leucine level already or leucine to lysine level already. In United States, your leucine to lysine level ranges somewhere between 170 to 190, where my requirement is about 110. That is 60 point higher leucine than what I should have in my diet. And at one point, I have more leucine in my diet. In the other side, I'm reducing my valine and isolation. What am I creating? I'm creating a perfect antagonism of all the things I explained for the, for the leg problems, 
for the feather problems. All of these are the prerequisite of exactly what you said right now. We reduce the drilling and isolation, and we increase the leasing level in our diet through formulations. And, and you are perfectly right. The layers is bred this way. The last thing they will give up is egg production. So what you will see is at first, if your isolation is dropping, you may start to see a reduction in case weight, maybe. But as the bird ages, then it starts to hit. I have one of the producer um, in Borsova, which is the second biggest layer company here in the United States. She did her PhD in Iowa State. And if you look at 2008 Christian Borgendahl's paper, she did all that research. When I presented her this data, especially this picture right here, she said, oh my God, when I did my valine titration trial, my layers that had low valine level, because when you do a titration trial, you all know that already, right? I have either five or seven levels. My middle level is where I want, to, what I want to be or what I guess it to be. Then I'll have two levels, which is lower, two levels, which is higher, because I want to see a plateau response, right? She said the lower levels, because they had seven levels in that diet, the lower two levels of valine, the birds were lame. They had a leg problems but they were laying eggs every single day when she was in the trial. So that is exactly what you said could happen in layers because layers is not going to give egg production easily. It's going to sacrifice its feathers or bones or body before it starts to sacrifice its um, eggs. So that's a perfect example of what you said would be a, would be a, it would not be a tryptophan, it would be a branch and antagonism that you have created. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh, for your questions. As far as I know, Dr. Singh is a renowned veterinary pathologist in North India and a poultry health consultant. By his questions, it seems that he is uh, developing a deeper insight, understanding, and expertise in, on the nutritional aspect as well. well this this is a very good question. Very, very good question. I really appreciate you all bringing the questions and, and helping me learn as well. So I appreciate that very much. Yeah, it's because of such questions that we are uh, um, getting, you know, to understand more practical aspects of poultry nutrition. Very true. Uh, be, beyond, of the ex beyond the expectation because of such uh, wonderful questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosan Adhikari. Uh, our third speaker, Dr. Dinesh Gautam, uh, has not uh, uh, sent a message yet, so uh, I, I beg a pardon. Uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, we, we have to stop this session now and join uh, um, 5 or 10 minutes earlier than 1 p.m. Nepali time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll disconnect for now. And again, join the meeting link, ID and passport will be so same. I request you all to join at uh, 12, uh, 55 uh, PM, Nepali time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adhikari, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, Vivek, for reaching out. Thank you, Vietnam, Nepal, and thank you, everybody, for the questions. It was a pleasure being in front of you all. Thank you.